The more I understand the Word of God, the more I understand why Christ has not yet returned and why Christians are so much less than what we ought to be. Because, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about our Father is that He continues to open our understanding. The, the Word of God says that the path of the just is like a shining light that dawneth more and more towards the perfect day. And it is true. I really appreciate how every day, every week, every month, every year, we continue to understand better and better who God is, what He's like, and His purposes for our lives. Today I'm going to look at something that we are somewhat familiar with, but I'm going to speak about one thing in particular that I believe may be a surprise to most of us. It's something that my mind is just beginning to see, and when I saw it, I didn't want to accept it, because it seems too amazing to be possible. But as I look at the Bible, I'm seeing more and more clearly that it is the truth. And I want to share it with you and hope that as you, as, you, as you see what I'm saying, you may agree with me and be benefited from what we will share today. The, 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 the title of my presentation, Thrice Begotten. And I know that you will understand immediately that I am referring to Jesus. I think, I think we understand in some kind of way that the Bible speaks of Jesus as being the begotten of God. And some of us might be aware that the Bible speaks of him being begotten on three occasions. Many people are not aware of this, but I want to focus on, on that idea this morning because there's something involved that is very important that I believe can help us to better appreciate what God has really done for us. First of all, I want to ask a general question. Who is a, a son, not this son, who is a son of God? Who does the Bible describe as a son of God? I think we kind of need a little bit of that background to better appreciate who Jesus was. The Bible says in Job 2 and verse 1, there we see reference made to some beings that are referred to as the son of, sons of God. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now there it says, these beings were called sons of God. Some people say that these referred to angels because Satan came with them. But others believe that these beings were representatives of other worlds created by God. And that what was really happening was there was, a me there was a meeting of the worlds in heaven and Satan came to represent this world. I'll come back to comment on that in just a moment. It also speaks about Adam in Luke chapter 3 and verse 38 and it says, Which was the son of Enos? Which was the son of Seth? Which was the son of Adam? Which was the son of God? In actual fact, this is the genealogy of Jesus. And it traces his history right back to Adam. And it says, Adam was the son of God. So Adam is called the son of God. And these beings in heaven, whether they are angels or representatives of other worlds, they are also referred to as sons of God. It says in Genesis 1 and verse 27, referring to Adam's creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I want to ask a question just on the basis of what we have looked at so far. Or maybe more than that. But what is it that really is the key ingredient in someone being a son? Because, you know, you have all kinds of different ideas of sons. You have, you have sons by adoption. You have sons by designation. You have sons where you just use the word as a term of endearment. Very good, son. You don't mean he's actually your son, right? So, so the, word, the word has taken on different meanings by common usage. But in the true sense of sonship, what is the key ingredient? What does the Bible focus on? Because it says Adam was a son, and it says these other beings were sons. 
And I think we find a clue here in what we just read in this verse. It says, God created man in his own image. And I would say the most vital element in sonship is the image of the parent. Forgive me for the image. I don't think those are the, the, the best examples I could have used. But they look like each other. So I decided to use them. And I think, I remember one, one person close to me. I remember one time, you know, a girl became pregnant for him many years ago. And he denied that, that, that the child was his. Most men, when they find themselves, or most young men, they find themselves in that position. They try desperately to get away from the responsibility. And that's what he did. He denied that it was his child. And then I remember when the baby was born and he went to see the baby. And when, he came, when, he, when I saw him again, his face was changed. He said, when I looked at the baby, I saw myself. And you can believe that after that, there was no more argument about whether or not he was a father. When he looked at the child and saw his image in the child, all his resistance went because that is really the argument that you are really looking for when you talk about sonship, to see your image in the person. That is the hallmark of, of sonship. And, and that is really what every parent is looking for when they look forward to having a child. Somebody who, you know, sometimes the physical re resemblance is not there, but the characteristics are there. It is a delight to a parent. I can tell you, as somebody who is a parent and a grandparent, that one of the joys is to see your characteristics expressed in this person. It gives you a lot of satisfaction, a lot of joy. It makes you feel that, I, I don't know, it may have to do with the fact that we want to continue. We feel like our, our existence is being carried on in this other person. So that image is a critical element in sonship. And so, why was Adam the son of God? The Bible says God made him in the image of God. So the image of God made Adam the son of God. And those beings in heaven, whoever they are, they also are sons of God because they are in the image of God. That's one of the ingredients. There's also something else that is brought out here. And it is that these were also persons who were created directly by God. I've tried to look at what the Bible says, and I realize Adam was created by God's own hands. And angels were created by God directly. So it seems that this is also one element of sonship, to be created by God directly or to have the image of God. So it's those two things. But there, the Bible reveals that there's also another avenue to being the Son of God. There's another avenue to sonship. And we find this expressed in John 1, verses 12 to 13. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power or gave he authority to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of the flesh, not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There we see the Bible says there's another way you, uh, that, that you, you could become the, the, the son of God. You could become the son of God because you are born of God. Meaning that you possess the spirit of God. Remember we say that the key element is what? To possess the what? The image of God. And if you have the spirit of God, you may not have the physical image, but you do have the spiritual image. God's spirit inside of you makes you possess the image of God. And so that image of God constitutes you being a son of God. As it says in Romans 8 and verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, what we see is that there are several elements involved in, 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 in being the sons of God. You can be created by God. You can, be, you can possess the Spirit of God. But the main ingredient is that you have to, have, you have to bear the image of God. When you lose the image of God, you are no longer the son of God. That is why Jesus could say to the Pharisees, you are of your father who? The devil. 
God made Adam in his image. He was the son of God. But was Cain the son of God? No, he was not the son of God. He did not bear the image of God. So the key ingredient in being a son of God is to bear the image of God. And that happens, in Adam's case, it was by creation and by possessing the spirit of God. In the case of us, Jesus, uh, the Bible says it is by being born of the spirit. It's by being led by the spirit. God recreates us and he places his image on the inside so we become the sons of God. Now we talk about the sonship of God because this is one of the, the key things I want to focus on today. There is a difference in the sonship of Jesus Christ. And the Bible expresses it in one word more than any other. In that famous verse in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail on the word only begotten. It's taken from a Greek word, monogenes. And this word has been so perverted and distorted by theologians that the, the New International Version translates it, his one and only son. I think it is the English Standard Version translates it, his unique son. This is a perversion of the truth. The word monogenes is taken from a Greek word, two Greek words, monos, and genos, monos means only, single. And genos means born, generated. It's the word from which we get words like generation, genealogy, genetics, all having to do with birth. So when the King James Version says, Jesus, God gave his only begotten son, it is exactly right. It means God's only born son. That's the correct translation. And that's exactly what the Bible is saying. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now I'm going to say something before I go any further. I'm going to come back to this, this point and dwell on it a little bit. But I want to say something right at the beginning. One doctrine in particular has made it very difficult to get a hold of this truth. There's a doctrine that is, that is popular in Christendom. It pervades Christendom and it teaches that G it teaches several things that, that make this, this verse a lie. First of all, it teaches that Jesus was not literally begotten Son of God. And there are many things that arise from this. You question when God gave his Son, what does that mean? Does it mean that he lent him and then took him back? Does it mean when he says he gave him, was it, did it mean that he suffered for three hours on a cross and then died to rise back the third morning. Is that what it means that when God gave his son? When it says God gave his son. Does it mean that for 30 years. God the son of God. Who was not really his son according to this thinking. Came to earth and became a man for 33 and a half years. And then went back to what he always was. Is this what it means that God gave his son? If this is what God did. Then maybe I could have done the same. Because if I'm going to lend my son for a time and get him back. I probably could bear it, even if he was going to suffer terribly. They say Jesus suffered so badly on the cross. Do you know that there were two thieves that suffered the same way? And maybe they suffered physically more. Because Jesus died in three hours, and I understand they survived for about three days. Because crucifixion was not normally a three-hour thing. Normally when you were crucified, it took days for you to die. So they would break your legs and put you, put, take you down in the evening and put you back up the next day. And they would they, break your legs so you couldn't run away. When they came to break Jesus' legs, he was dead already. So he died quicker than those other thieves. So if you think that, that what God did was give his son to suffer a little bit, well, a lot. But that other men suffered the same way and even worse. Then you think, what did God really give? So it's important for us to grasp what this verse really means. And I think that is something that we have, we have missed because... There is an error in the thinking of Christians that has, that has obscured this truth. And even though we have gotten away from that error of the Trinity, even though we have gotten away from that error of the Trinity, the residue is still in our minds. And it has blocked us from understanding what God did 
when he gave his only begotten son. Let me continue. Is creating the same as begetting? Some people say, we say that God created Jesus because we say he begot him. There's a brother, an old brother, has been a friend of mine, but man, I don't know if it's true that old people head tough. I don't know if it's true that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This brother is so upset with me because I said Jesus was not created, he was begotten. He said it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Creation is different from begetting. And here's a simple illustration. Adam was created, wasn't he? God took him from the dust of the ground. God took dust and formed it into a man and then blew the breath of life into it. What about Abel? Was Abel made from the dust of the ground? Did God take his hands and shape Abel? Where did Abel come from? Where did he receive life from? Abel received life from a life that already existed. Adam received life from, from creation out of nothing. Adam's life was not, did not come from a parent. If you say Adam's life was an extension of God's life, then you are saying that Adam was a divine being. Adam would have been the begotten son of God. He would have been a divine being equal to God. No, he, was not, he did not come forth from the life of God. God created Adam's life separate from the life of God. But Jesus, but, but um, Cain and Abel, the children of Adam, they came from a life that already existed. They were not created. They were born. They were begotten. So there is a difference. When we say Jesus was God's begotten son, we are not saying he was created. If he was created by God, he could not be a divine being. But he came from a life that already existed. He came from the life of God. So he has to be divine. His life has to be equal with God's life because it is the same life. Just like I am equal to my parents and my children are equal to me because it's the same life. So there's a difference. Creating is not the same as begetting. The claim, those who believe in the Trinity make several claims, and I'm going to outline them on the board here. First of all, they claim that Christ was begotten by the Incarnation. They claim that he became the Son of God when he was born in Bethlehem, but he was not the Son of God before. That's what some claim. Others claim that Christ was begotten by the Resurrection. He was born when he was raised from the dead. That's when he became the Son of God. They claim that he was begotten by designation or role playing. What they are saying is that Jesus was not really the son of God. But sometimes back there in the days of eternity, God said, listen, one of, one of the gods, one of the three said, listen, I will be the father and you will be the son and you'll be the Holy Spirit. And we are going to, to take up these roles. So he's a son by designation, not because he was actually the son of the father, but it was just designated this way. There are Christians who actually believe this and teach this in trying to explain what is called the Trinity. Four, they say Christ was a son figuratively, like the prophets, because they say, the prophets were the sons of God in a sense because they were God's representatives. So they say when the Bible says that Jesus was the son of God, it was because he was a great prophet, not because he was actually God's son. These are four ways in which many Christians unfortunately try to get away from the reality that Jesus was actually God's begotten son. Now I'm going to say that in what these Christians say, and what these Trinitarian Christians say, there is partial truth. Mark that. I'm not saying that they're absolutely wrong. I'm saying there's a partial truth. And many times, there's, tr there's partial truth in a lot of error. Do you know why? Because if Satan tells you a complete truth, it's too easy to pick up. And if Satan comes to you with a complete truth, then he cannot... When, when Satan takes the truth, I'm going to show you a truth that Satan has distorted very badly in this very presentation. I'm going to talk about something that is a big falsehood, yet it is based on a truth. And because of the falsehood, because the falsehood is in our faces, we have failed to see the truth. 
And that's how Satan operates. By taking the truth and making it into a lie, he makes you afraid of the truth and so you never see the truth. It's like, do you believe that when a person dies, his spirit can get up and run around and frighten people? No. And so because of this, I grew up in a system where they told me that man does not have a spirit. They told me that when the Bible says the spirit leaves man and goes back to God, they say it just means the breath. They say all that spirit is is breath. Why do they say this? Because they are trying to get away from the idea that there is a spirit that can survive after your body dies. They are trying to get away from the idea of the immortal soul. And that is a correct, it is correct to try to get away from that idea because that idea is false. But at the same time, what they have done, they have thrown out the baby with the bath water. Because they say, man does not have a spirit. Man does have a spirit. The truth is that this spirit cannot be conscious when a person dies. But man does have a spirit. The Bible says the body returns to the dust. The spirit returns to God who gave it. Job in, 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 in Job 38 it says that there is a spirit in man. And the spirit of the almighty giveth him understanding. James says the body without the spirit is dead. Jesus when he was dying said. Father into your hands I commend my spirit. Not his breath. When Stephen was being stoned he said Lord Jesus receive my spirit. Not his breath. Man does have a spirit. But that truth has been hidden. Because people are trying to get away from the idea of the immortal soul. They threw out the baby with the bath water. So there's partial truth. In what the Trinitarians say. And let's look at the partial truth. Christ became the son of God. On three different occasions. I will show you that clearly from the Bible. When the Trinitarians say Jesus became the Son of God at the resurrection, they are correct. When they say he became the Son of God at the incarnation when he was born in Bethlehem, they are correct. But they don't accept that he became the Son of God way back at the beginning of before the ages. And there they are incorrect. Because the Bible teaches all three things. And we look at that. And I just want to point out that each time Jesus was born, was begotten of God, was critical to our salvation. When you understand it, it is, it is so wonderful how God designed that Jesus was born three times. And each time was necessary in order for man to be saved. Let's look at Christ's third birth first of all. Now I admit... I have misused this verse in the past because I've used this verse to prove that Jesus was born back in heaven, back in the ages. And now I realize I was wrong to use the verse this way. Sometimes the verse teaches something and you don't look at it properly and you misuse it. And I did that. Here's what the verse says. Hebrews 1 and verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. You look at this verse and you think, okay, it says, God says, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is talking about way back in the ages before time began. But in actual fact, the Bible tells you plainly, that is not what it is talking about at all. Let's see. This statement is taken from Psalm 2, verse 7. And there God says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It's talking about a point in time when the father says to the son, You have become my son this day. I have begotten you this day. Look at how the apostles interpret this verse because you have to look at how they understood it in order to understand it properly. In Acts 13, verses 32 and 33, this could be Peter speaking or it might be Paul but listen to what he says and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again as it is also written in the second psalm thou art my son this day have I begotten thee 
So according to the apostle, I think it was Paul, Acts 13, I think it was Paul. According to the apostle, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was the fulfillment of Psalm 2, as it is written in the second Psalm. When it says in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It was speaking of the resurrection of Christ. So the Bible teaches us clearly, Christ was begotten, he became God's son in a special way by being born from the dead. Romans 1 and verse 4 suggests the same thing. It says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead declared Jesus to be the Son of God. Hebrews 5 and verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my Son, today have I begotten thee. So when did Jesus become a high priest? What made Jesus qualified to become a high priest it was it was the begetting from the dead it was the resurrection from the dead he could not be high priest until he was born from the dead so when God says you are my son this day have I begotten thee he's speaking about Jesus becoming his son in a special way that qualified him to become our high priest and there is there is a whole sermon in this there's a world of, of, of wonderful things in this. He was born from the dead. And what does this mean? He was humanity coming back into existence. Reborn by the power of God as a brand new race. Think about who Jesus was. Jesus was born the second time, the second time as who? As a human. And in that second birth he became the second Adam. He became a member of the human race. He became a member of the race that was condemned. And he bore that condemnation to the cross. And what did he do with it on the cross? He destroyed it. But in the process, he died. He died in the process. When Jesus died on the cross, the old humanity died. What came up from the grave on the, on the resurrection morning was a new creation. He was born as a firstborn from the dead, he was born as a new creation, a new kind of race. And God, because he was, he was born from the dead by the power of God, the Bible says in, in, in um, Romans 6 and verse 4, I think it is, that he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. God brought him back to life, not as the same person that he died. He, was, he, he died... Uh, he died he died a human being. He was raised from the dead with power as a life-giving spirit. Amen. When he rose from the dead, he was the first of a new race of men. He was the first of the new creation. And because of what he is, we have hope. We have, the, we, we have the authority to be called the sons of God because he has brought us to that place by the power of the resurrection. In this birth, in this being born from the dead, Jesus was the first. But he was not unique because there will be others like him. Because we are going to, the human race, the redeemed humanity is going to follow Jesus Christ in that resurrection, in that new creation. Because Jesus says, I'm he that liveth and was dead and I'm alive forevermore and behold I have what? I have the keys of death and of hell. Revelation 1 and verse 18. I have the keys of death and of hell. When Jesus rose from the dead, he carried the key with him. And so Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Sometimes we misunderstand it. We think it means that the church is not going to be defeated. Not so. What it means is that even death is not going to hold us down. Because a lot of our people are in the grave. And when, when somebody dies, they become the prisoner of Satan. Or, or, or it was so until a certain point. But now Jesus came from the dead. He broke out of Satan's prison. And he carried the key with him. And so now the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Because Jesus has the key to the gates of hell. So he was the firstborn of this new race. But there's a whole multitude of people that he's going to bring with him. So in this sense, Jesus was begotten of God. 
but not the only begotten. Because there are many others who are going to be begotten from the dead. And just in passing, I want to say, you might say, what about Moses? Wasn't he raised from the dead? How come Jesus is the first begotten? I'm going to say something that people don't like, but it's the truth. Moses was raised from the dead, but not to everlasting life. He was raised from the dead and he got long life. He was living in heaven for about 2,000 years before Christ died. But he was not raised to everlasting life because humanity had no everlasting life until Jesus was raised from the dead. If you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians 15 and about verse 20 to 21. It says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, what? Your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. If Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. Read Hebrews 11 when he talks about the men of faith. By faith Enoch, by faith Moses, by faith Elijah. And it mentions those three too. And then it comes to the end of the chapter and it says, These all died in faith, what? Not having received the promise. So they never received everlasting life until Jesus died and was raised from the dead. So Jesus was really the firstborn from the dead. He was the first person who was born to this new existence. He is the firstborn. It says, in bringing many sons to glory, God made the captain of their salvation perfect by sufferings. He could not bring us to glory till he himself was perfected. And he was perfected by the things he suffered. And so he's able to bring us to glory. We will be saved because he is the new creation. Because he produced the life in which we live. Let's look at Christ's second birth. Luke 1 and verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we see here that when Jesus was born in Mary's belly, when he was, when he was conceived, the angel says he will be called the Son of God because he's ex he will come into existence by a direct act of God. Jesus could call no man on earth Father. Like Adam was created by the direct act of God, Jesus became a man. He was created a human being by a direct act of God. Now granted, Mary formed a part of that, that existence because he received his humanity through Mary. But at the same time, no human being can come into, into existence without a human father. Jesus was unique. God created him in a different way from any other human being, except Adam. Adam was made by the hand of God, and so was Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 and verse 4 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent his son, made of a woman. Made, the word is, is used. Because he was formed by God's divine intervention. He did not come into existence in the normal human way. He was begotten. That's what the Bible says. You know, he was begotten by the Holy Spirit and became a, he, he became the Son of God because he was born of God. He bore the image of God by this unique act of creation by God. And so because he was born into humanity, he was fully one of us, partaking of our fallen condition our sinful state, but not our sin. But he was a part of our sinful state because he bore our weaknesses and our frailties. He, was, he got tired as easy as anybody. The, the, the ravages of sin were upon him. If he lived long enough, maybe he would have had a bald head. He would have, you'd have seen the lines on his face as he grew older. His hair would have turned gray. He was subject to all the sinful effects that plague the human race. In this sense, his sonship was just like Adam, because Adam was made by a direct intervention of God, and Jesus was conceived by a direct intervention of God. It was in the normal human lines. So in this sense, Jesus was not unique. And there are two Adams. There are two like him. There was the first Adam, and in this sense, he becomes a second Adam. So he's not God's only begotten son. He's begotten of God, 
but not the only begotten son in this sense. Otherwise, he would not be the, the, the last Adam. There was one before him. That one failed. He came to succeed. But there are two of them. Nobody else is called Adam except Adam and Jesus Christ. But you can see that in this sense. And in the other sense that we looked at first, the third sense, Jesus is not only begotten. Begotten from the dead, he's the first, but not the only. Begotten from, uh, into humanity, he's the second, not the only. But this second begetting, this begetting as a human being, qualifies him to take our place. So he could relive Adam's experience on our behalf. He could deliver us because he became one of us. Because he was fully a human being, he could save humanity. You had to be one of us to save us. We don't have the time to look at why, but I think most of us will understand. Now we're going to go to Christ's original birth, and this is the most amazing of all. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17. Many, many of those who believe in the Trinity insist that this is talking about some other begetting. But I want us to look at it closely and we'll see that it is talking about how Christ originally came into being. It says, who is the image of the invisible God? Now notice again, we see there the image of God, which is a true mark of sonship. Isn't that right? The firstborn of every creature. Now, Jesus was not a creature, but the word creature there simply means the firstborn of all that exists. It really means the firstborn of all creation. And all creation is everything that exists. Jesus is not the first created. He's the firstborn. Because he was not created. The Bible says he created everything. Jesus created not only all space and matter, but he also created time. So but when Jesus came into being, when he was born, there was no time. So he was born in a timeless age. And what do you call timelessness? Eternity. He was born in eternity. And then after he was begotten, he himself created time. He created matter. He created space. Somebody says to me, no, he was always, time was always there. I say, if time was always there, time is equal to God. Because whatever God does not create is equal to God. But even physicists and scientists are learning that, that time is something that is, that has, that has, it's not matter, but it is something substantial. You, they can, you can bend it, you can, you can go back, you can go forward in time. Man is not able to do it. But they are discovering that time is a real thing. Somebody had to have created it. There had to be a time when time came into existence. The Bible says, Jesus created all things and without him was nothing made that was made. So he himself was begotten or born before time existed. How, do you know, how does Paul prove that he was the firstborn? Here's what he said. For. When you see this word for, what does it indicate? You are giving the reason for something, right? Because are the reason. Why do I say that he's the firstborn of every creature? Paul is saying, why do I say he's the firstborn of every creature? For. By him were all things created. If he created everything, he had to be what? Before all things. So when Paul says he's a firstborn, he's talking about firstborn in point of time. Some people say, oh, he was just a firstborn. Like, like you know, he was, he was one of God's, he was special to God. So he's called the firstborn in a figurative sense. Wrong. The, the, the passage itself tells you he was firstborn because he created everything. He could not have created everything except he were born before everything. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And it says it again. And he is before all things. The point is made twice. He's before all things. That's why he could create all things. He's a firstborn. And by him, all things consist. So there we see this passage teaching clearly that Jesus was begotten in eternity before anything was created. Now the thing is, 
immediately after this verse, there comes another verse. And I want us to look at this other verse. It says, and he is the head of the body. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This verse in verse 18 is talking about being born from the dead. And this verse in verse 15 and 17 talks about being born when? In eternity. But verse 18 talks about being born from the grave. So the passage is talking about Christ being born two times. But if you just take on the verse 18, you will say it's talking about being born from the grave. But you have to look at the verses carefully and you see Paul is talking about two times that Christ was begotten. Both of them are in the same passage. Because notice this verse begins with what? And. So it is saying in addition to what I said in verses 16 and 17, in addition to what I said, here is something else to consider about him. So it's saying Christ was there from the beginning and he created all things. And now, in addition to all of this, he is the firstborn from the dead so that in all things he will have the preeminence. He had the preeminence before and now he will have the preeminence again in the resurrection. Here's another verse. Hebrews 1 and verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, if he brings the first begotten into the world, who is the person that he brings into the world? Who is this person before he comes into the world? He's the first begotten. He doesn't bring him into the world and then he becomes the first begotten. He brings him into the world when he's already the first begotten. He brings the first begotten into the world. Remember we said, when Jesus came into the world, was he the first begotten in this sense? No. No. Adam was before him. Adam was the son of God in the same sense before him. So Jesus was not the first begotten when he was born into this world. He was the first begotten way back in eternity. And he was also the first begotten from the dead. But this is what he's talking about. When he was brought into the world... He was, his identity at that time was the first begotten. So God brought his first begotten and put him into the world. So this is talking about him being begotten in eternity. And then when you go to, but the interesting thing is, this is Hebrews 1 verse 6, right? Go back one step to verse 5. It says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He's talking about the begetting from the dead, right? Isn't that what we saw? Yeah. This verse refers to him being born from the dead. And immediately he goes to verse 6, and he says, And when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. So he talks about him being begotten from the dead, and then he talks about him being brought into the world. Two verses side by side. But they are talking about two different times when Christ was born. So you have to be careful when you're reading the Bible to read the thing carefully. Otherwise, you'll get confused. And a lot of people do this. They get confused. Now, the value of the gift is what I really want to spend a little time looking at because here is where the wonder of it really hit me. 1 John 4 and verse 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God. What does that word manifested mean? To be demonstrated or to be revealed, right? God's love is revealed towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now, the word of God says, it says in the same first John, that we love him because he first loved us. You can't love God properly unless you understand what God did to reveal his love. That's why I say if you think God lent you his son for 30 years and then took him back. You can't appreciate the love of God and you cannot love him appropriately. Anybody here that somebody gives his life for. You will worship at the feet of that person. If I am, if I am in danger of losing my life and brother Arthur gives his life to save me. 
for the rest of my life, I'll take care of Sister Zemri. Because it's the only way I can show him how I appreciate it. I'll never forget him. Every step that I take, I, I'll realize it's because of him why I'm still able to step. Every bite I eat, because of him, I'm still able to bite. I can't forget him. I can't lose sight of him because my life is responsible for it. That's how we treat somebody that we really appreciate and who we really think did something for us meaningful. But people don't respond that way to Jesus because in their thinking, God lent his son and took him back. Yeah, it was, it was a sacrifice, but... I mean, God, you live for eternity. And you have had your son for eternity. And then you lent him to us for 30 years. Eh, we appreciate it, but it's not really such a big thing. Honestly, that is how people tend to think about it. And, you know, they, they try to manufacture ideas to make it seem more, more terrible. Like, you know, the, the, the movie The Passion. I never saw it, but I've seen pictures of how they... They demonstrated how Jesus was whipped and there's blood everywhere. I remember one poor young man who went to see the movie and he came the, to our fellowship in Spanish town the next week and said he had made up his mind to become a Christian because of the visible torture that he saw in this movie. Not surprisingly, that conversion lasted about two months. It lasted about two months because your mind can only feast on gore and blood and torture for a little while. If you don't understand the real meaning of what he did, it's not going to last. The Bible says God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. The value of the gift is the identity of the gift. Am I right? The value of the gift is the identity of the gift. If you miss the identity of who, who God gave... You can't appreciate who was really given. That's the first point. The value lies in the identity. So you ask yourself, yes. who was it that God gave? Mm -hmm. And did he really give? Yes. Here's a, a, there's a parable that Jesus told. It's in Mark chapter 12 and verse 6. And I want, you to re, I want us to just read the, uh, one verse from it. Jesus tells a parable about some men that he gave out. That the, the, the master gave out the vineyard to some, some people. They rented it, right? And when the vineyard started to bear and, and, and flourish, he sent some of his servants to collect the taxes or the rent, whatever it was. And they beat the servants and they treated them terribly and sent them away bleeding and bruised. And he got another set of servants and he sent them and the same thing happened to them. And then in verse 6 it says, Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved. He sent him also unto them saying. They will reverence my son. Now what happened to the son? They said this is the heir. Let us kill him. They killed the son. And this parable is an illustration of God's relationship to us. Isn't it? And the son represents Jesus and the father represents God. But the point I want to make is that it says in the parable, having yet one son, his well-beloved, he then sent him. It was not after the son arrived that he became the son. From the moment that the father decided to send the son, he was already his son. He already had this well-beloved son. And that teaches you clearly who Jesus was. He was the son of God before he was sent. He was his well-beloved. He was born from God's own life. And this guaranteed that he was exactly like God. Jesus is the only one who could perfectly represent God and carry out his purposes in the universe. Now, it's very important because I'm telling you, God could not represent himself. And if you think that's a strange statement, I'm going to prove it to you. The person who knows me Best of all, are the people who know me best of all. There's my brother Tony. He has known me for 64 years. There's my daughter Annalise. She has known me for 30 years. There's my wife Jen. She's not in here, but she has known me for 40, about 41 years or thereabouts. And she has known me very closely for those 41 years. I would put her up, up near the top of those who really know me. Anytime my wife comes to you and tells you, that David is a person that you cannot trust. You'd be well advised to believe her. If she's a, because 
She know me. You only see me on Sabbath. You see the best face. But she knows me. And when she says this, I can come and say, it's not the truth. But because she has known me so well, and if you know her to be a truthful person, she has great power to destroy your faith in me. At this time, the only hope I can have is that my brother Tony and my daughter Anna Lee will step forward as a witness and say, I have known him. Tony can say, I've known him for 64 years. It is not true. Then you now have a, a, a chance to begin to balance between the two of them and you have another witness who can stand up for me, right? But I can't defend myself because if I'm accused of being a liar, you never can tell but that I might be telling you a lie. When Lucifer accused God of being a liar, God could not defend himself. Because he was so convincing, he convinced many of the angels. Therefore, his arguments were persuasive. God could not solve the problem by just coming and saying, it's not true. He needed a witness. And there was one who knew God longer than Lucifer had known him. There was one who was exactly like God. He could stand up for God. Jesus was the only true witness for God because he was the only one who was exactly like God, who was in the bosom of the Father, who knew God intimately. So, the fact that he was exactly like God was a guarantee that he could be God's representative. Secondly, and, and, and in this respect, in this way, there was none other like Jesus. Can you see where in this sense he's the only begotten? Begotten from the dead, there are many of us. Begotten into humanity, there are two of them. Begotten in the image of God, the only begotten son, there's no other being like him in the universe. This is what he was in his origin. So in eternity, he was begotten into the universe. In 3 BC, he was begotten into the human race. And in AD 31, he was begotten into the new humanity by being raised from the dead. Can you all understand what I'm trying to say? And this makes it clear that, you know, if somebody says to you, Jesus was begotten by God from the dead. Yes, praise the Lord. Jesus was begotten by being the son of Mary. Hallelujah. And then you can add, but Jesus was the only begotten by being begotten in eternity. And hopefully they can say praise the Lord too. Because the scriptures are there to support it very clearly. In saving us, Christ automatically elevated us to a higher place than man had ever been. Because what Jesus did in the new humanity, what God did was he took divinity and united it to humanity. Adam was the son of God because the spirit of God was in Adam, right? But Jesus was the son of God because he and God shared the same life. So when Jesus became a part of the human race, he brought divinity into humanity. And it is this divine human life that is raised from the dead and that is now imparted to you and me. We are the sons of God in a way nobody else in the universe is except Jesus Christ. God has elevated us to a place higher than the angels. Would God that we could understand and believe it. Now I'm going to ask one question because I'm coming to my critical point. What is identity? It's a strange word. I'm going to give you the dictionary meaning. From, um, I think this is dictionary.com. Here's what it says. It's a state of remaining the same under different conditions. That's one. It's the condition of being one self and not another. Thirdly, it's the qualities or the beliefs that distinguish a person. Fourthly, it's the sense of self providing continuity in personality. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a doctrine called reincarnation? Put up your hand. All right. Do we all understand what reincarnation is? Okay, I'm going to explain it. Remember earlier on I said that sometimes Satan takes something that is true and he makes it into a lie. 
and he, he deceived, and because of this, you never see the truth. Remember I said that? Yes. Yes. All right, I'm going to bring you back to that point. Reincarnation is a belief that is popular among Eastern religions. It's the belief that when a person dies, he's born again into another form. Sometimes another human being, sometimes he becomes a greater person, sometimes a lesser person. They believe it is based on how you live your life. So if you live a very bad life, you could be born again as a cockroach. And if you live a very good life, you could be born again as a king. And they believe one day by being born again and again and again, you eventually become to the place where you are born again into God himself. So reincarnation is rightly believed to be a false doctrine. Now I'm going to ask a question about reincarnation for those of you who understand it. When a person is reincarnated in this doctrine, does he know about his former life? No. They say what happens is that the spirit moves. When you die, your spirit moves into a different kind of existence, but you never remember what you were before. I've been thinking about it and looking at the Bible, and I realized that the lie is based on the truth. Because there was one time in history, one time in the existence of the universe, when reincarnation really took place. It was when, it was when God gave his son. When I think about it, I couldn't believe it, I couldn't accept it. What if my, 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 my son or my grandson, what if I know that my son is going to die? His spirit is going to come back, but he's not going to know anything. He will not know me. He will not, he will not remember the times we had. He will not remember how it was. I'm going to get him back because it's the same spirit, the same, the same, the same nature. And he's going to grow up and learn all over and become another person. And I'm going to have him back in a secondary sense. But the first identity, identity is gone forever. It will never come back. What if that were to happen? Could I give my son like that? I thought about it and something inside of me said no. No, couldn't be. Even God couldn't do that. Even God couldn't do that. He couldn't give away those ages of fellowship. Look here. The Trinity made me believe that when God gave Jesus, he was still the same person. They say he was two persons in one. He was human, but the divine part was there, and that divine part was still God Almighty, right? That followed me even into the truth that I now believe with the idea that, okay, God gave his son. But he only lent him and then Jesus became aware of who he was and all his memories came back and he, he came back to who he was. Not true. Find that in the Bible for me. It's not in the Bible. God gave his son. Jesus lost his identity when he was born as a baby in Mary's belly. He began to learn again about God. He began to grow up. And God maybe revealed certain things to him, but it was all second hand. He did not go back. He never went back to what he was before. That identity was gone forever. Jesus Christ, when he was born in Bethlehem, it was God's son. He was God's son. But he was God's son coming back into existence in a new identity. God lost what he had before. He gave that away. Jesus, think about what Jesus did. He, would I choose to do something like that? Would I choose to be given up like that? And, you know, okay, you see, I'm coming back, okay, because the same, the same spirit is coming back. But I don't know anything. I've lost my past. I'll never again remember those times we had. You might tell me about them, but I'll never know. I'll never remember. If you think about it, the Bible teaches this is how it was with Jesus. And I'm going to show you some clues that make this clear. In Luke 2 and verse 52, it says that Jesus increased in wisdom. How do you increase in wisdom if you already know everything? He was a human baby. He was born a man. He was the son of God. The spirit was placed in this human body, 
but he began to learn like a man. He didn't just... He didn't just come back into existence in his almightiness, knowing everything. He increased in wisdom. He began to grow like any human baby. Look at what happens on the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does he know everything? Has he gone back to his almighty memory? Because before he came here, he knew that this was going to happen. Before he came here, he knew he was going to die. He knew that God was going to forsake him. But when he became a man, that life was gone. God got a new son in the incarnation. The old one was gone. I can begin to understand what it cost God to give up his son. Because... When I think of that sacrifice, I could never make it. I could never accept it. I could never lose my son in that way. I could never. You know, I'm going to tell you, when I used to watch movies, I saw a movie, a science fiction. It was about, it was about, it was about parallel worlds. There were many worlds, but they were parallel. In other words, all the people who are in this world, they exist on, on other worlds. And the story was about a man who, the villain killed his wife. But before the villain killed his wife, they built up your, your knowledge of this lady, how she was nice and how they were in love and they spent time together. And then she got killed by the villain. And when the villain killed her, I felt... I, I was so attached to the movie, I got so caught up in it that I felt like some, I lost something. And from that point, I didn't enjoy the movie anymore. And then at the end of the movie, what they did, they, they reward, whoever was in charge of whatever, rewarded this man by taking him to live on another one of these worlds. And he met a lady. And when you look at the lady, it was his wife. But it wasn't the same wife. It was the one who lived on the other world. So when he met her, she didn't know him. But he said hi, and he was happy to meet her. And the, 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 the show ended by seeing that the two of them were getting to know each other. So, so the idea is that he got back his wife. Do you feel like he would have gotten back his wife? Well, when I watched the movie, I wasn't satisfied. Because what he did is like he got back a twin sister. I mean, it's just a show, but I'm trying to make a point. The fact that somebody comes back who has the same image doesn't mean it's the same person. If my grandson were to die and you give me back one exactly like him, it would not be the same. If my wife were to die and somebody come back just like her, I would feel so frustrated. Because I can, I can say things and talk about things and memories and she has none of that. It's not the same. It's not the same. I'm dealing with a stranger. I have to build all over again. It's a different relationship. I'm saying to you, that's what happened to God's son. God lost his son. He got back one just like him. But he lost that one. And he never got him back. That's what God and Jesus decided. Because let me tell you. If Jesus was to become a man. God had to lose him. Because he couldn't be a man and remain God at the same time. In the sense of knowing and being almighty like God. He couldn't. It would have been a sham. God would not really have given anything. To give him. To make him one of us and to save us. He had to give up that son. And it blows your mind, yes, brother. Bill. Yes, in light of what you're saying, how do you explain John 17 5? The glory which I had with you before the world was. What the Bible teaches us is that Jesus began to learn through the Father's revelation. Jesus knew who he was in terms of, he says, before Abraham was, I am. But how did he know that? Education. Education. Education, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you where it's brought out. No, 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 never. So how you that is gone. How do you explain that text? I'm going to. Okay. You're going to say something, Willie. Really. Exactly okay. Look at this verse. And when the tempter, it's John, it's Matthew four and verse three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, "If thou be the Son of God." 
command that these stones be made bread. Why did Satan say, if you are the son of God? What is he trying to do? Shake his confidence. Can I say to you, if you are Conard Howard, do so and so. You laugh in my face, right? Because you know who you are. The only way he can say, if you are the son of God and shake his faith is because Jesus knew by faith. He didn't know by innate awareness who he was. He knew by faith. He didn't have his memories. If he had his memories and knew who he was, Satan, you're an idiot. You're a fool. What are you trying to do? He knew who he was by revelation. By faith, he knew he was the son of God. Not by innate knowledge. Because all that awareness came to him by revelation. Not by remembering. Not by going back and, and knowing who he was in the past. He, that was gone forever. And that is, that is so amazing when you think about it. It says in Hebrews 2 and verse 17. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. If he was not like his brethren in all things, he could not be our high priest. He could not have saved us. And if he were, if he were at the same time God Almighty with all his memories, or if at the same time while he was here as a man, he, he remembered everything and knew of his previous life, he could not be like me. Because there's no way he and I could have the same experiences. Because I have never known that I lived with God back in the ages of eternity. I have never known these things. I live by faith. He also lived by faith. Yes, the verse I wanted to get to. I don't have it on my list, but I'm going to ask you to look at it here. It's in Philippians 2. Look at what it says. Philippians 2, and I'm reading from verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not, a, not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So listen. Jesus is not exalted to the pinnacle of the universe as the only begotten Son of God. That is gone. That is dead forever. He's exalted to the pinnacle of the universe as the son of man, as the firstborn of the redeemed race. And look what it says. Because he humbled himself even unto the cross, God exalted him. God gave him a name that is above every name. He's not restoring him where he was before. He's taking a human being and putting him at the pinnacle of the universe. It's a different exaltation. It's a different experience. Jesus ends up back where he was before, but not as the same person. And because he gets to that place, we are able to go there with him. Amen. Whereas as he was before as the begotten son of God, if he had not died to that experience, he could not have brought many sons to glory. But he said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He had to die. He had to lose his identity in order to be able to save us. And I think of what God did when he gave his son. But I also think of what that son did when he agreed to that. Because I'm not agreeing to that. <laughs> I can't lose my identity, man, and then come back and you don't know how it was before. My God, how... How, what confidence you have to put in your father. What? To step into the unknown. So I, really, I realized twice Jesus died. He died when he stepped out of heaven. And when he went to the cross, again it looked to him like he was going to die forever. And he still went forward. Twice he died. 
Twice he died eternally, as it were. One time it was really. He did die eternally when he became a man. The second time he was threatened with eternal death. And he still went forward. What a plan. What a, what a love. What a, what a God. What he has done for us. I praise him and give him thanks. And I hope you will also join me in doing the same.